The Hezbollah Party of God movement was formed in 1982 in Lebanon by a segment of Shia community displeased with the secular, in their view, nature of the Imam moderate Shia party. There were also disagreements concerning whether Israel should be confronted using new organizational forms and methods of warfare. According to its general secretary, Hassan Nasrallah, since its formation, Hezbollah was a purely intra-Lebanese creation, relying on the support and aid from the Palestinian and Lebanese parties, while the support from Iran and Syria came later. Since the very beginning, Hezbollah's activities have been based on three principles. First, Islam is a clear ideological, doctrinal, and practical basis for the organization's functions. Secondly, its main aim is the struggle against Israeli occupation of Lebanon and Palestine and against Zionist domination. Third, it recognizes the Iranian Shia thesis concerning the necessity of vilayat e faqi the Shia doctrine which asserts that during the era of the 12th grave reappearance of Imam Muhammad al-Mahdi, the leadership over the Shia is transferred to high-ranking Shia clerics. Hezbollah, an organization, has a structure based on certain ideological principles that exist within the framework of a state that has no actual influence on the movement's activities. The party is led by Shura Council consisting of seven members, six spiritual leaders, ulamas, and one secular leader. The members are elected by the Central Council, Al-Majlis al markazis consisting of the 200 most authoritative members of the movement. Shura Council elections consist of three phases. The first is a candidate selection, usually 70 to 80 people, which consists of both clerics and secular individuals who satisfy the criteria set by the top leaders. Those who pass this stage have the right to participate in the second stage. In other words, they become candidates for the Shura Council. As a rule, 10 to 15 people make it to the second round. The final phase consists of the direct election of the seven Shura Council members. Council decisions are final and religiously binding on all party members. They are adopted either unanimously or by the majority of votes. If there is a deadlock or a split within the Shura Council, issues are decided by the party leader, whose decisions are final and obligatory on all administrative institutions and cannot be challenged. This is how the principle of vilayat e faqi is observed and splits within the ruling elite are averted. The actual operations of the party are conducted by administrative executive apparatus known as Shura Tan Fiz. It consists of five councils. 1. Executive Council, which provides oversight over political and organizational matters, including social, cultural, and educational activities. 2. Polite Bureau, which addresses intramovement matters. Third, Parliamentary Council, which concerns itself with Hezbollah activities in the Lebanese legislature. Fourth, the Judicial Council, which issues religious resolutions and carries out arbitration on matters of disagreement relying on Islamic law. And finally, fifth, the Jihad Council, which directs the movement including oversight, recruitment, training, equipment, and security. Each council is usually headed by a Shura Council member. The movement general secretary is Hassan Nasrallah, who is also the supreme commander of its armed formations. Leadership also includes his deputy, a spiritual leader who is also the supreme judge. Some Lebanese legislators, the military formation commander for southern Lebanon, and regional leaders of the organization. The executive council has various departments responsible for specific areas of activity, welfare, healthcare, information, press, finance, external communications, and coordination. Assessments of Hezbollah's armed strength vary. Iran's FARS news agency data from October 2016 put Hezbollah's army strength at no less than 65,000 troops, including reserves. Of them, 21,000 are professional soldiers with constant training. According to the 2017 military balance, currently 5 to 8,000 Hezbollah troops are fighting in Syria. Beka Valley, the commander's responsibilities include control over armed shipment from Iran 
to Syria for the Sheikh Abdullah military camp that's under joint command by the Hezbollah and the Syrian army. According to various sources, this region's forces consist of at least seven infantry battalions with 252 people each. Three of them are motorized. South Beirut. According to various sources, this region includes at least two battalions of 252 troops, one of them motorized. South Lebanon. After the Taif Treaty of 1989, Hezbollah formations were reorganized and placed under a unified command. The current commander is responsible for Hezbollah military and special security formations and may also command the Lebanese army units in South Lebanon. This region includes at least seven battalions of 252 troops each, five of them motorized. Moreover, one should note the non-trivial fact of the existence of a full-scale, by Iranian, NATO and Russian measures, tank regiment. In November 2016, near the city of Al-Qusayr, Homs province, Syria, there was an inspection of Hezbollah equipment. The photos showed T-55, T-62 and some T-72 tanks, some two S-1 Gvozdika Havitzers, BMP-1 and 2, M113 APCs with 14.5mm machine guns, ZSU-57-2 SPAA. Most of this equipment apparently came from SAA arsenals and was obtained from the Lebanese army and possibly Iran. Of the most interest are the hybrids assembled using Quadrat, SA-6, SAM track chassis and Soviet-era KS-12, 85mm and KS-19, 100mm AA guns. While their effectiveness against modern aircraft and drones is doubtful, they are useful as direct fire support against land targets. Other interesting weapons are the modern Cornette ATGMs mounted on quadricycles. These self-propelled ATGMs are able to effectively fight any modern tank, including Israeli. By all appearances, this unit was formed to prosecute the war in Syria, where thousands of Hezbollah fighters are constantly on the front lines. The absence of direct fire support such as tanks and artillery undermines the success of operations. Therefore, it's logical to assume that Hezbollah decided to assemble an arsenal of its own armor and accompanying artillery to ensure battlefield success. Being a fully-fledged political and military organization, Hezbollah understands that it is surrounded by enemies such as Israel and radical Sunni Islamists. Therefore, having a tank regiment with experienced crews is of vital importance, as the units present a serious force by the standards of Lebanon and the adjacent countries. The prolonged civil war in Lebanon, the permanent standoff with Israel, and now also the struggle against Sunni Islamists, in other words, the constant balancing on the edge between war and peace makes the movement flexible in its command arrangements and able to quickly and appropriately react to emerging problems. One can also draw the conclusion that paramilitary wing of the Hezbollah, in spite of external attributes of partisan movement, which it was 20 to 30 years ago, is gradually becoming a fully-fledged army with a training establishment, a command structure and a logistical segment. The preparation of a future fighter starts at a very young age. Kids aged 6 are involved in discussions and as they grow, they receive more advanced political and religious preparation. A sample training regimen includes studying Quran, a day at the mosque, I love my country, how to run a household, summer camp, and I submit to my leader. Younger kids' uniform, as a rule, includes blue shirts with epaulets, white scarves, and pins with the image of Khamenei. Older boys spend several weeks during the summer in camps in the south and in Becca Valley where they train and acquire survival skills while obtaining more in-depth religious preparation and studying their native language and culture. Then they transfer to the Imam al-Mahdi scouts. One of the scouts' mission is helping the poor. According to the scout's head, if kids who lost their father or their brothers were left to their fate, they would withdraw inwardly and develop psychological problems such as aggression. At the age of 17, those who excelled at the scouts become members of Ta'abiyah or the reserves. 
At the same time, education does not seek to promote absolute hatred towards Israel, despite what Western journalists love to depict. The education system is first and foremost based on developing a national and religious identity, the context in which the Shia community of Lebanon exists. In an interview provided by a Hezbollah fighter, it was noted that those who choose political independence become social pariahs. Such people can't even visit their villages, given that the family and the society hate them. Cadre troops are focused on combat training, and each receives a specialty such as an ATGM gunner, a sniper, or demolitions. Regular Hezbollah fighters undergo training in specialized camps in Lebanon, Syria, and Iran under IRGC office leadership. They conduct training for the rank and file and select outstanding individuals for special units. Some of them become commanders, others are selected for the special security apparatus. Tabia reservists are engaged in protecting villages and are selected from the scouts. Qatar fighters and reservists undergo service in one of the districts, Israel-Lebanon border and the Latania River area, Nasser Brigade, or North of Latania, Badr Brigade, or Beka Valley, Haidar Brigade. Each Hezbollah brigade in South Lebanon has a sector in northern Israel that it is supposed to occupy. Combat and special training in each brigade take into account local geography. One should also note that border terrain is fortified. There is a large-scale network of tunnels, bunkers, and minefields. Using the tunnels, Hezbollah can concentrate a large number of troops on the needed attack sector without being spotted and attacked from the air. Due to fighting in Syria, Hezbollah opted to conduct training courses with reservists lasting 60 to 90 days. Commanders are also sent to the battle zone to obtain experience. Intensive operations and unavoidable losses have forced commanders and troops to remain in a war zone, Murabata, for longer than their rotation periods. For the reservists, it was 15 days a year. Before the Syrian war, the border with Israel was considered such a zone. Currently, the rotation period in the Syrian war zone is 20 days and may be increased if the situation demands it. This is considered optimum as it allows for having trained and rested troops available in case of any escalation on the Israeli border and in Syria. Here is an example of a news report regarding deployment of Hezbollah units from May 20, 2017. The Radwan Special Unit and other were fully withdrawn from Syria and replaced by the Badr Brigade, which is stationed in the eastern and northern part of the Aleppo province. Aziz Brigade was withdrawn from the outskirts of Palmyra and al Qaim Brigade temporarily replaced it there. Moreover, the Rod 1 unit was brought to an elevated alert level and sent to South Lebanon, Latania River and Sheba Farms on the Israeli border. al Jalil Brigade, intended for operations in Galilee in case of war with Israel, remained on its permanent position in South Lebanon. The Nasser Brigade, which is directly under Hassan Nasrallah, remained in reserve. The Rod 1 unit was named after the head of Special Security Department, Ahmad Mugniyeh, pseudonym al Haja Radwan, who was killed in 2008. The unit has much experience in raids and is the most prepared for urban warfare, which makes it irreplaceable in Syria. If there is a new war between Hezbollah and Syria, it will be the first line of attack. Hezbollah leadership reviewed its concept of operations after the start of the Syria war. Before the war, the emphasis was placed on defensive ops in built-up areas with small units to inflict maximum troop and equipment losses on the IDF, while simultaneously shelling Israel using a large number of short and medium-sized rockets. In Syria, Hezbollah realized that it has to wage offensive ops in cities. Therefore, it reconsidered its training system, increased its rocket arsenal, and provided more heavy weapons and recon systems. The first operation where Hezbollah took offensive using large units was the battle for al Qusair in April to June 2013. Some 1,200 to 1,700 best-trained Hezbollah troops took part in the battle. They were divided into 17 detachments, with later further division into teams of 3 to 5 troops. Prior to the attack, the command performed reckon of the city and its approaches, then divided the city into 16 sectors, one for each detachment. Each region had its codename, 
During the battle, this allowed for command of forces, using open channels of communication, without the enemy being able to take any countermeasures. Hezbollah command undertook the direction of SAA tank and artillery units near the city. Considering that the city was in the Islamist hands for over a year and was well fortified, the ratio of losses was nevertheless 5 to 1 in favor of Hezbollah. The battle showed that with proper organization, a fortified city can be effectively attacked by a small force. As far as the military direction of Hezbollah units in Syria by Iran is concerned, it seems probable that Iran directs Hezbollah units down the battalion level, sometimes down to company, using IRGC specialists from the Al-Quds force. It can't be ruled out that the IRGC specialists coordinate Hezbollah and local self-defense forces like Kataib Hezbollah and Asaib al-Al-Haq. Units smaller than a battalion don't warrant the provision of specialists. There is a need for a large number of trained cotters able to command and provide assistance. One of the factors influencing cooperation in this instance is the language barrier, Arabic in Lebanon versus Farsi in Iran. Hezbollah became one of the factors which allowed to turn around the war in Syria since its troops were able to fight in cities. The SEA in 2011-2012 was organized along 1970-1980 lines to fight combined armed battles mainly against Israel. New realities have shown that this army was unable to fight as small units in the cities. Moreover, the SEA has not fought for a long time. Its last significant operations took place in 1982. Therefore, it had no commanders with urban warfare experience. Hezbollah, on the other hand, has constantly fought Israel since the moment of its creation. Generations of commanders have honed their skills in the years of clashes and battles with the IDF, causing it serious losses during the 2006 war. Israel was forced to retreat from South Lebanon, and Hezbollah's reputation has risen to unprecedented heights. Israel's military command is worried about Hezbollah's operations in Syria since its paramilitary wing will now be able to wage offensive ops using heavy weapons and a huge number of short, medium rockets. The fact that Hezbollah has become a keen to a regular army is confirmed by IDF's rethinking of its approach to the fight against it. First, IDF is preparing for fighting big formations up to a brigade whose task will be invading Israel and capturing villages or military bases. Second, it is paying a special attention to combating tunnels, including technical and psychological preparation of its troops to fight in tunnels. The movement's distinguishing characteristic is the enormous rocket arsenal which, by various estimates, contains between 50,000 and 120,000 weapons. And not merely an arsenal, but a whole system, from rocket part and fuel factories to storage facilities and camouflage launch sites. The existing land-based arsenal includes various short-range ballistic missiles, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, and multiple rocket launchers. Most of the weapons come from Iran and Syria. The possession of the Scud Ds is doubted, including doubts of the Western media. This system requires qualified personnel and specialized equipment since the rocket uses liquid fuel. To assess Hezbollah's effectiveness, let's look at the shelling of Israel in 2005. At the start, according to Nasrallah, there were over 12,000 rockets. Official Israeli police reports noted 37,700 rocket strikes on the country, including 901 strikes in the cities. Thanks to the civil defense, only 44 were killed and 1,384 were wounded. One is also tempted to note that Hezbollah mostly used rockets with ranges under 100 kilometers and small warheads, as no SRBM strikes were noted. This was due to the small number of SRBMs and Israeli effort to destroy them, which was partly successful. Hits by 600 to 980 kilogram SRBM warheads would have had a catastrophic consequence on cities. The presence of SSMs proved a surprise for Israel. On July 14, 2006, Israeli Corvette Hanit was hit by a Chinese-made C-802 SSM launched from the short. The ship's air defense was turned off since nobody expected an SSM attack. Four sailors were killed and the corvette was incapacitated for three weeks. The 165-kilogram warhead 
most likely failed to explode, otherwise the corvette would have sunk. Having a large rocket arsenal made in Iran, PRC and Syria raises the question of whether Hezbollah has its own factories or rockets. If it does, they manufacture certain numbers. It's been a long time since the last war with Israel. Launching a rocket after a lengthy storage could be dangerous to its launch crew. It would seem that the war in Syria is being used to use up old Russian and Chinese rockets, of which it has large numbers. The situation is more complex with SRBMs. They are very expensive to make. It would make no sense to establish their production on territory which at any moment could be bombed by Israel. With proper servicing, such rockets can be stored for up to decades. It's likely that some assistance here is provided by Iranian civil and military specialists. Building a rocket plant on the territory of another country is a whole different matter. In August 2017, Israeli media reported that Iranians are building a ballistic missile plant in northwest Syria. It is built near the coastal city of Banias, tens of kilometers from Tartus, where the Russian base is located, and south of Khmeimim, where Russian aircraft are based, protected by S-300 and S-400. Therefore, the factory can be protected against Israeli strikes. According to experts, the plant will produce Fateh-110 rockets for the SAA and possibly Hezbollah. The rocket arsenal has been modernized and expanded. At the start of the next war, Hezbollah will be able to launch 1,500 rockets a day instead of 200 in 2006, covering the whole territory of Israel and not only the border regions. There are reports that Hezbollah has Russian SSMs obtained from Syria instead of the unreliable C-802. Therefore, Hezbollah rocket arsenal is not a network of warehouses full of artisan rockets dangerous to its own crews. It's a whole range of industrially produced weapons capable of destroying land and naval targets at various ranges. All of the above does not mean Hezbollah seeks war with Israel, whose leadership should be aware that if there is another war in South Lebanon, Israel's civilians will face unprecedented threats. Hezbollah's Special Security Department is responsible for both intel and counter-intel and implements several missions, one of the most important being professionally carried out operations abroad at the behest of Shura Council. Imad Fayez Magnia was the head of the Special Security Department until 2008 when he died in a car bomb blast in the Kafr Susa neighborhood of the Syrian capital Damascus. Responsibilities of the department's head and shore include oversight over the following departments. 1. National Preventive Security Apparatus, which provides personal security to high-level spiritual leaders. 2. Internal Security and Intelligence Apparatus, which tracks political and religious reliability of the Hezbollah members. 3. National Central Security Apparatus, which observes, tracks, infiltrates, and if necessary eliminates military or political individuals or groups seeking to interfere with Hezbollah in Lebanon. 4. Foreign Combat Cells and Intel Apparatus. This department partly overlaps with the Central Security Council, depending on the types of requests received by cell leaders. Imad Mugniye is the individual who made this department one of the most powerful secret services in the world. He was born in 1962 in a Tayir Deba village in South Lebanon. He started his career in the mid-1970s in the Fatah organization. In 1977 to 1982, he was a member of its intelligence and special units, 417, Unified Security Directorate, etc. After an advanced course under the IRGC instructors at the Imam Ali base in Bekaa province, he headed the personal security team of a prominent Shia cleric, Muhammad Hussein Fadlala. Before 2005, Hezbollah was to a large extent integrated into Lebanese intel services, including Amn al Am, main directorate for common security, which expanded its ability to carry out intelligence and counterintelligence operations. After Hezbollah was accused of being complicit in the death of the former Lebanese PM, Rafiq Hariri, in February 2005, Hezbollah members were forced to leave the Lebanese secret services, which affects the movement's intel work. The Special Security Department studies Iranian and Israeli experience. 
According to Israeli intel members, Hezbollah has a large agent network in the Israeli Defense Forces IDF and Amman military intelligence. This opinion is supported by the presence of limited access Israeli mod maps, manuals and documents on captured Hezbollah members. The movement's intel successes are largely based on exploiting familiar and criminal ties between Israeli and Lebanese Arabs and the well-oiled cooperation between Hezbollah intel and Palestinian Authority armed formations. Moreover, Hezbollah intelligence often uses interrogations of captured officers and soldiers and data obtained through recruitment of senior Israeli officers. For example, Hezbollah was able to recruit IDF Lieutenant Colonel Omar Al Haiba, a Bedouin. This officer occupied a high post in the Western District headquarters. He was one of the most capable Bedouin officers in the IDF. After a serious wound, he was disabled, but nevertheless returned to the IDF and earned awards for his agitation among the Bedouins. This officer was arrested on suspicion of giving Hezbollah secret information on IDF forces on Lebanon border and the schedule of patrols. On June 18, 2006, a court-martial sentenced him to 15 years in prison for espionage, contact with enemy agents, and drug trade. Due to the secrecy regime in the special security apparatus, little is known about foreign terrorists in intel cells. As a rule, they become known only after major events. Hezbollah selects people for special operations from among its own special units. These people are believed to be well trained and prepared to die for the sake of the mission. Some of them are from Arab and Islamic organizations that have ceased to exist. All of Hezbollah's special operations are handled by special security apparatus with support from Iranian and Syrian intel and special op forces and from the IRGC. Members of the overseas cells are thoroughly trained. They have knowledge and information about the country where they work. They speak the language of the country. This attracts less attention from civil and military authorities. Infiltration unit equipment includes Israeli or other military uniforms, depending on the mission. Units infiltrating Israel speak Hebrew, use Israeli weapons and equipment as camouflage, and are familiar with all types of weapons used in the region. Members of special infiltration units and members of the suicide units differ, among other things, by their uniforms. For example, jihad detachments wear green or black clothing, carry Semtex C4 or C9 charges, and usually wear masks on operations. The following jihad detachments are known. 1. Islam Bula Brigade, assassination of political activists. 2. Al-Quds Brigade, two units of suicide bombers consisting of 56 each, the Fatih Shkaki Company and the Ahia Ashaya Company. On the Maad Mugniya initiative in the early 90s, a special unit of Hebrew-speaking Lebanese Palestinians was formed. It had the task of eavesdropping on IDF army frequencies. Later, essayists sought to improve their language and professional skills at the center of Islamic science and culture and its branches in Iran, Syria, and Lebanon. One should note that the Hezbollah units and controlled territories are targets of Israeli human intelligence efforts. Israeli border police, Magav, includes the Yamas unit, which camouflages its members to look like Arabs. During the 2006 war, Hezbollah counterintelligence located and destroyed an Israeli agent network in South Lebanon and Beirut. The network conducted espionage in Hezbollah headquarters and transmitted this data to the IDF. Agents from among local population set up equipment to monitor Hezbollah military installations and use GPS devices to guide munitions, spread glow-in-the-dark powder around buildings and command centers, rocket warehouses, and launch sites. Still, IDF and Israeli intel was not able to kill or capture a single senior Hezbollah official or destroy the command system, since the shelling of Israel continued no matter what. Hezbollah places particular importance on the media. It owns a satellite TV channel, Al Manar, four radio stations, and five newspapers. Without any doubt, Hezbollah's image was to a large extent formed by Al Manar, broadcasting since June 1991, and has gone satellite in 2000. It has become Hezbollah's face to the world. The channel is unique. Before its existence, Arab media consisted of newspapers and radio stations. 
Experts believe its audience is secondary only to Al Jazeera. Al Manar became the official channel of the movement, demonstrating accomplishments, particularly in the realm of fighting Israel. Its broadcasts consist mainly of news and political programs, broadcasts dedicated to the memory of martyrs, informational, and entertainment shows. It is also unique in that it broadcasts in Hebrew for the Israeli population. While Western media depicts the al Manar as propaganda for a terror group, the channel does not broadcast any information on making bombs, executions of Israeli soldiers, blowing up of checkpoints, and other forms of cruelty. Hezbollah radio stations Al Noor and Al Imam broadcast from the southern Beirut. Al Islam broadcasts in South Lebanon, and Saft Al Mustad Afin broadcasts in the area of Beka River Valley. There are also newspapers Al Balad, Al Ah, Al Mutalag, Al Sabil, and Bakuto Allah. The movement has a website www.makawama.org. Its content includes the most important news from Lebanon and the world video addresses by the movement's leader, respecting the memory of martyrs, opinion polls, and memorable dates in the movement's history. Agitation video broadcast by TV and web channels are of high artistic and directional quality and take into consideration the preference of the audience and Arab mentality not only in Lebanon, but in the world. Even though the Hezbollah is known in the Western media as a terror organization, it defies that label by the multifaceted aspect of its activities. Apart from fighting in Syria and against Israel, it is part of Lebanon's legislature, provides education and media services to the Lebanese. In 2000-2010, Hezbollah spent several billion dollars on humanitarian efforts in Lebanon. The organization builds kindergartens and schools, hospitals and clinics, and even supermarkets. Its fighters and their family members can take advantage of many services with major discounts. Education in Hezbollah built schools is cheaper than in public schools. The poor obtain stipends. Of course, the education focuses on the Arabic language, Islam, and Shia traditions. But English language and physical sciences are also taught. The schools provide a very high level of instruction by ME standards. The media also focus on those who fell for the freedom and independence of Lebanon. As a sign of respect for the martyrs, which is how the Shia community views them, the funerals are attended by senior officials. They also participate in any funerals of people who perished in the battle or in other circumstances. This is apparently due to Hassan Nasrallah's having suffered a personal loss. His eldest son, Hadi, became a martyr during the fighting in South Lebanon. If the killed fighter had children, they are taken under care, receive education or jobs. In spite of financial problems, providing money for Qatar soldiers and for the families of the dead is a top priority. Mu'assasat Jihad al-Bina, or the Fund for Sacred Struggle, was founded by the Hezbollah in 1988. It quickly became one of the most visible NGOs in Lebanon. Although it's autonomous, its activities fall under the pure view of the Social Services Department its main aim is to lessen the burden faced by the poor families by relying on God's aid in fulfilling their moral and Islamic obligations. The fund operates in southern districts of Beirut, Beka Valley, and South Lebanon. The fund provides more than half of population of those regions with water, helps farmers with procuring livestock, fertilizers, fuel. It carries out electrification of the most backward villages. Muassasat al-Shahid, or the Martyrs Fund supports the children of killed or captured fighters and civilians. It provides housing, jobs, and support for widows, and runs a job placement office for the youth. Lujnad Imdad al Khamenei, or the Khamenei Support Committee, was formed right after Israel aggression of 1982. It helps poor families, particularly those which suffered from Israeli occupation. The aid includes monthly benefits, food parcels, basic necessities, clothing, health services, and education. The committee provides medical assistance including, through medication, diagnoses, surgeries, and rehabilitation, to tens of thousands of patients a year. The financial and technical incapacity of the Lebanese government, particularly the Ministry of Health, forced the movement to take under the control of the Islamic Health Unit the hospitals of South Lebanon. Hezbollah Education Department is headed by an office titled al Tabia Al-Tarbaviya, or the Education Directorate. It provides financial aid to the needy Hezbollah members. 
Its expenditures are extremely important to the movement because public schools suffer from lack of funds for construction and education technology. The education department also provides needy students higher education in applied sciences and religious studies in various institutions such as Technical Institute of the Great Prophet, the Technical Institute of Sayyid Abbas al Musavi, the Institute of Saidad al Jakhra, the Institute of Saikh Rahib Harb, and the Islamic Sharia Institute. Other types of aid include paying for textbooks and school materials, and part of the tuition in public and private schools. A variety of sources of funding, donations, business, and Iran's support ensure the party's independence and economic stability. Its assets are held in the Sadarat Bank of Iran, or in other banks and accounts from individuals, to prevent the US and the West from seizing its assets. The party is a huge corporation whose assets belong to the whole party, not just specific individuals. The main sources of funding are direct subsidies from Iran, no more than 100 million per year, although 200 million before the fall of the oil prices, contributions by Shia community in and outside of Lebanon, profits from economic and banking activity, income from smuggling, illegal sale of weapons and drugs are not taken into consideration in this context. According to Pew Research Center and the World Factbook CIA, Shia Muslims represent a high percentage in about 25 countries. One should keep in mind that Pew data have often been criticized by Western experts and Shia diasporas for underestimating Shia numbers. The Islamic concept of zakat states that when it comes to deeds performed in God's name, including supporting warriors waging jihad, the poor, or people propagating Islam, the average worker should contribute 2.5% of their salary. Considering the multi-child families, which are the rule in Muslim countries, one does not consider non-working wives and children, zakat may be paid by up to 10% of the community. Thus, the Shia diaspora may contribute no more than one-fifth or 120 million US dollars for financing Hezbollah. This calculation does not include income tax, since each country has a different tax law. One should also keep in mind that not all Shia in the West and Persian Gulf are supportive of Hezbollah's military aid to Syria. For example, NGO surveys of Shia in the Persian Gulf states in the second half of 2013 suggest that the percentage of supporters fell to 30-50%. to 50%. This is apparently due to Hezbollah's being given an image of an aggressor by the media of these countries, which can't help but influence financing. After IS was proclaimed in 2014, India's Shia issued a statement proclaiming readiness to send 30,000 volunteers to Iraq to fight radical Islam. There is no information concerning the Shia of India or neighboring countries providing aid for Syria. More than 100,000 Lebanese have permanent residence in African countries, including 60,000 in Cote d'Ivoire, 25,000 in each Senegal and Sierra Leone, 16,000 in Nigeria, 6,000 in DRC, 5,000 each in Gabon and Cameroon. The majority of Lebanese in Africa are not Christians but Shia. They have concentrated control of much of profitable business, which allows them not only to live well, but to support their historical motherland. In 2008 alone, money transfers from African Lebanese exceeded $1 billion. It is difficult to assess Lebanese Shia affluence in Africa due to the never-ending financial crisis. Since it is Hezbollah that runs active social programs in Lebanon, one can assume the majority of remittances end up on the organization's accounts. Overall, the movement collects no more than $500 million a year. It is not much, considering it is waging a war in Syria and is financing the social sector of the whole country. After the IDF withdrawal from most of Lebanon in 1985, Hezbollah, with active support from the IRGC, began to create its own weapon arsenals, and January 1989 Damascus Tehran Agreement allowed Hezbollah to restore its military infrastructure and resume operations in South Lebanon. Thus, by 1991, Hezbollah became the leading Lebanese resistance force operating in the country's south against the IDF. Starting in the early 1990s, Hezbollah began a transition away from being a purely paramilitary formation. In the summer of 1992, Iran's leaders recommended Hezbollah transform itself from an openly extremist organization into an active Lebanese political force. 
Hezbollah reached an internal compromise between the moderates and the radicals, established a ceasefire with Amal, and began active preparation for parliamentary elections. Hezbollah today acts as a leading political force in Lebanon and as a major Shia social and humanitarian organization. Lebanon has an estimated 2.5 million Shia out of 6.2 million total population. IDF withdrawal from South Lebanon in 2006 was a huge victory in the eyes of the Arab world. Hezbollah has truly become a significant regional factor. Growing its influence in Lebanon and Syria and the region with Iran's help, Hezbollah has become a base for recruitment, training and preparation of volunteers for battling Israel and radical Sunni organizations. Hezbollah units often fight like regular army units. One of the reasons for the rise of Hezbollah's regional influence is the strategic coordination between the Lebanese and Iraqi Shia, and also Syrian Alevites, due to the continuous war in the Middle East. It's important to note that the organization has proved its worth even in the darkest hours of Lebanon's history, such as the many years of almost uninterrupted slaughter, but also during the perennial clashes with its external adversaries, even dangerous ones like Israel. Opinions of Iran's influence vary. Some experts claim Iran's aid is so important that it fully affects all aspects of Hezbollah's decision-making process. Naturally, Iran's authority as the leader of the Shia around the world is near absolute. It also provides Hezbollah with tremendous military aid. Moreover, the movement has suffered losses in Syria. Its most professional and best trained fighters have perished there, which weakens the organization. Therefore, Hezbollah leaders have to show more flexibility and care in its dealings with Iran if differences of opinion arise. The more likely explanation is that Hezbollah maintains considerable independence due to its exceptional political standing in the country and of its nature as a strike force against Israel and Syria's Sunni. Since the start of conflicts in Syria in 2011, Nasrallah tried to maintain neutrality. Hezbollah became involved only in 2013, when the situation grew out of control and there was a danger of combat spreading to Lebanon. Nasrallah stated in one of his announcements that Iran should be viewed as a center of strategic influence in the region as the model of a sovereign state which supports nations in their search for independence and as a force which helps countries and nations of the Middle East become stronger. Syria and Iran can't force Hezbollah to act against its own plans. They can only argue with us and try to convince us. Since its independence, Lebanese government paid little attention to the problems of the southern parts of the country. Therefore, Hezbollah has assumed the role of helping the poor and developing infrastructure, not only for self-promotion, but because it was objectively necessary. Practically since birth, a Lebanese Shia is under Hezbollah's care. Kindergartens, clinics, school and institutions, all of that has been built and financed by the movement. So it's no surprise that the movement is hugely popular and service within its ranks is considered honorable. One should especially note that today, Hezbollah is more than a movement. Even though it has not declared sovereignty over part of the country, it has every attribute of a state. It has a legislative, executive, judicial authority, institutions for the collection and distribution of taxes, its own education system, a military intelligence and counterintelligence, media, all of that exists and functions within the movement's framework. Moreover, it has control over its subjects, the totality of information about them, and, most importantly, it relies on their good will to work with the movement in some form. The concept of citizenship is not after all defined by a passport, but by an individual's willingness to associate to a state or a movement and be loyal to it. Here is what is written about it by one of Hezbollah's ideologues and the Deputy General Secretary, Sheikh Naim Qasem. From the theoretical point of view, we're calling for an Islamic state, we're drawing others into that process, since only an Islamic state may facilitate the maximum of human happiness. On the practical level, this question depends on the free human choice, in addition to the Quran Ayat 2.257. There is no compulsion in religion, the correct way is quite separate from the false one. Whoever does not believe in idol worship but believes in God, has found a reliable foundation which cannot be crumbled. Barely, God is all-hearing and all-knowing. The victory of radical Sunni groups in Syria would also mean the possibility of merciless annihilation of all other religious groups following the Iraq scenario. 
after the US invasion of Iraq triggered a civil war, and later the appearance of ISIS, which proved unspeakably cruel towards all other beliefs, it sent the message that in these conditions of ethnic and religious warfare, only paramilitary organizations, like the Hezbollah, can ensure their own survival. Hezbollah's popularity among Lebanese Shia is based on several factors. Its military campaign against Israel, its holy Lebanese nature, its role as a defender of the historical repressed Shia community, its religious nature, and its wide range of social services. Hezbollah has done more for the Shia community in Lebanon than the official government. Since the very start of the involvement in the war in Syria, the movement leaders say that its fighters are defending Lebanese Shia and Shia holy sites from the spread of extremist Sunni Islam, represented first and foremost by Jabhat al-Nusra and IS. According to Nasrallah, this was not a war of choice but of necessity. Lebanese NGOs, which carried out a survey in 2015, noted that 57% of respondents view the threat of radical Islam to Lebanon as real, and 80% view Hezbollah as making the life in Lebanon calmer. Lebanon today, just as the Middle East as a whole, is experiencing renewed interreligious and intercommunal slaughter. People living in unstable and unpredictable countries are trying to find protection and support among their own national or religious community. Therefore, it is no surprise that Hezbollah enjoys such unconditional support among the Shia of Lebanon and Syria, even if they don't fully support the movement's aims and missions. <laughs>